Hello, my name is John Bussing with The Wall Street Journal. I'm here today with former Vice President uh, Dick Cheney, who has a new book out um, on uh, his memoirs on his uh, life and his time in government. Uh, and we're here to, today to talk a little bit about foreign policy, your thoughts on a range of issues. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if we could maybe start with the Mideast, uh, what's happening in Egypt now. We just recently saw the Israeli embassy ransacked. And I'm wondering how you would assess U.S. policy toward the Mideast now. Uh, did the U.S. get out in front of history, or uh, did we abandon old allies in your mind? Well, it's a... Uh First of all, it's it's a risky business to predict what exactly is going to happen. I think you know we'll we'll have a better perspective maybe uh, uh, a few years down the road when we can look and see what emerges from this period of turmoil. Clearly, it's been a time of of uh, pretty intense change and ferment. I was thinking back, just comparing the present to what it was like in years past. Uh, I can remember being sent to the region in the. Uh, August of 1990, when Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait, and uh, President Bush, uh, 41, sent me out to begin talks with the Saudis to persuade them to allow U.S. forces into the kingdom and so forth. And as I made that first trip to the region, uh, there were two people I had to see. One was King Fahd in Saudi Arabia, and the other was uh, Mubarak in Egypt. And uh, those two guys were, were crucial. They turned out to be our best allies, and with their approval, we were able to put half a million troops into the desert, uh, get overflight rights so we could fly directly in there, use of airfields, um, use of the Suez Canal to move ships back and forth, even if they were nuclear powered. Um, and the question I asked myself the other day as I looked at that and thought about that time was, if I got that mission today, go to Saudi Arabia and Egypt and, and uh, work out uh, an arrangement uh, for the deployment of U.S. forces to the region, then where would you start? What are you going to do in Egypt? Now, obviously, I, you could still deal with Saudis. There's been a fair amount of stability in their government. But in Egypt, it would be uh, very difficult to know how to proceed. Had it gotten to the point um, where there wasn't much option for the U.S. government but to abandon um, uh, Mubarak in that protests in the streets were such that military force uh, uh, put against those mm -hmm. protests might have resulted in killings that would have been unacceptable. Well, I, I think the, clearly they decided uh, not to use force. I think the Egyptian military had a lot to do with that. I'm told, I don't know, I just don't know what I read in the newspapers, and, and I'm still in touch with some friends in the region, um, that uh, they're going to have Tantawi testify in the Mubarak trial, but uh, in, in private, won't be made public. And, and the real questions turning around his role and Mubarak's role is, did he order somebody to fire on civilians mm -hmm. or did somebody else do that? Uh, to what extent uh, was there an active role by uh, the government in that regard? And um, I just, I don't know the answers to that at this point. Do you think it's conceivable we could have kept Mubarak in power through this? Um, I think it would have been difficult. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm reluctant to make hard and fast judgments, partly because we don't know what's going to happen. But it struck me that um, he'd reached a point uh, some time ago where he was uh, in some considerable difficulty. I think part of it was a function of age. Um, I think if he were going to undertake reforms, uh, he waited too long. He should have uh, done it sooner. And, uh, of course, now he's, uh, he's paying a pretty stiff price. Mm -hmm. um, but um, I'm not... Um, uh, sanguine about what's ultimately going to emerge over there. I just don't know. Mm -hmm. And uh, I talked with an Egyptian friend this week. Uh, he doesn't know either. Mm -hmm. uh, is it going to be Muslim Brotherhood? Uh, what happened to the people who organized the original protest and Tahrir Square and so forth? Uh, who's going to emerge from that? What's the role of the military going to be? Mm -hmm. Is it going to be a, a positive one? Or uh, are there potential problems there? Nobody seems to have a handle on it at this yeah. stage. Yeah, and this was exactly the concern that the Israelis had during this right. this whole... Uh, well, and we've uh, seen what's happened there in the last yeah, few days. that's right. That's right. Yeah. Well, if you had to 
make your best uh, mm -hmm. attempt at distilling out those possibilities. Um, what do you think does uh, uh, emerge as the focal point of leadership in, uh, in Egypt? Is it going to be the military? Is it going to be some iteration of the Muslim mm -hmm. Brotherhood? Well, right now, I think it is the military. I think the military is pretty strong in Egypt. Uh, they've got a fairly strong economic base as well, and as they're engaged in a lot of enterprises that uh, that are, are go beyond what uh, militaries often are, are involved in. I know uh, Field Marshal Tantawi and I were defense ministers at the same time together. Now I'm a book author and he's still the defense minister. Mm. Uh, it hasn't changed in all these years, 30 years. But um, I think the, uh, the potential is that the uh, the military sort of can conceivably be sort of the ultimate safeguard uh, going forward. But if they aren't, then uh, you worry very much that you'll see something like uh, the Muslim Brotherhood emerge. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, uh, we've seen uh, a lot of trouble in connection with the own, our own difficulties that we've encountered in places like Afghanistan with uh, Osama bin Laden and Al-Qaeda. Uh, Zawahiri, remember, comes right out of right. Egypt and uh, Cairo and was part of the attempt on Sadat's life. And uh, it's not clear that, uh, as I say, what will emerge from this. I've talked with some folks who seem to believe, uh, certainly hope, that the, uh, the Al-Qaeda style of Islamist fundamentalism uh, is being discredited through this process. And that, in fact, the values that are most uh, sought after by uh, many of the people who have been instrumental in the Arab Spring uh, are values uh, that we'd be very comfortable with. Mm -hmm. But I just don't know. Yeah. Are we handling Libya properly? Um, I uh, am glad to see Gaddafi depart. I think everybody is. We don't quite know where he is yet. Um, I'm also, as I look back on that, I'm uh, pleased that uh, we were able to strip him of his nuclear capabilities some years ago. I mean, remember when we went into Iraq? and took down Saddam Hussein a few days after we'd captured Saddam. Muammar Gaddafi went public and announced he was giving up his uranium enrichment capabilities, his centrifuges, his uranium feedstock, and his weapons design. All that was turned over to the U.S. back in 2004. Um, that was a very positive development in light of what's happened since. Mm -hmm. But um, I think, uh, again, Libya is a place, one of those places, where it's not at all clear who's going to emerge when the dust settles, who's going to be in charge in Libya? We don't know. Yeah. In your book, you describe <clears throat> uh, President Bush as saying that he hopes North Korea has its Gaddafi moment, mm -hmm. referring to right. what you just described, which yeah. was uh, a realization best to give up the new program. Um, and in fact, uh, that didn't happen. But I'm wondering now. It didn't happen in North Korea. Yes, it did happen in Libya. That's, that's right. Yeah. That's right. Uh, I'm wondering now, um, given uh, what happened to Libya uh, without nukes, uh, whether or not North Korea would say uh, the last thing we want to do is uh, give up a nuclear program or Iran give up a nuclear mm -hmm. program because look what did happen to Gaddafi uh, in Libya. They were able to come in with conventional yeah. weapons and they weren't worried about the, the nuclear capability of the mm -hmm. country. Well, of course, the North Koreans are, are significantly further along. They've now right. had two weapons tests. Uh, not only have they been producing uh, uh, warheads with uh, plutonium, but they've also now got a robust uh, uranium enrichment program, which some of us suspected, but it's now been proven. They've had people in, outsiders, and showing them the centrifuges. Right. Um, I don't think uh, that... Uh, uh, I, I haven't seen anything recently that leads me to believe they're going to give up their, uh, their nuclear aspirations. Um, whether or not they uh, um, continue to proliferate is sort of the, the ultimate test here. The President Bush at one point, after they tested their first weapon, um, laid down a marker and said, don't proliferate this technology to anybody else, especially to terror sponsoring states. And unfortunately, they did. They went ahead and built a reactor in Syria for the Syrians that was like the one they'd been using to produce, uh, produce plutonium weapons. Right. Right. But if you're Iran and you haven't tested your weapon yet and you look at uh, Libya, um, doesn't that entrench your interests even further? Don't you think the last thing I'm going to do is, is give it up? Is give it up? No, uh, I'm sure that the, uh, the folks behind the program in Iran, uh, Ahmadinejad and so forth, are convinced 
that uh, they need to have nuclear weapons. Um, they're spending a lot of money, a lot of major resource commitment uh, to that very purpose. That doesn't mean the rest of the world should sit idly by and allow it to happen. Uh, I think the idea of a nuclear-armed Iran is, uh, is a frightening one, frankly. I think the Israelis will find it that. I think the Israelis uh, are going to uh, look on Iran uh, if it, in fact, uh, follows through and tries to acquire nuclear weapons as a, as a threat to their very existence. And as a result? As a result, I think they're more likely to support a robust option to, uh, to uh, eliminate that possibility. We had uh, uh, Michael Hayden in just a couple of days ago mm -hmm. who said that uh, the only time that George Bush uh, raised his voice uh, to him was uh, when he said, don't ever put me in a position of having just two options with uh, Iran. That is, um, accept things the way they are and do nothing mm -hmm. uh, or uh, do something, uh, right. meaning military action. Um, and uh, Michael Hayden, former CIA uh, director, uh, suggested that that's pretty much the trajectory of where we're headed now with Iran. Yeah. Would you agree with that? I don't know um, uh, whether or not uh, the Obama administration looks at it in that light as sort of an either-or proposition. Um, my belief always was that we needed to keep the military option on the table. And I used to argue for that publicly in my speeches, that uh, the only way you could hope to make the... Um, um, diplomacy, aggressive diplomacy, credible was if, in fact, they knew if they didn't comply diplomatically uh, or go along with whatever uh, peaceful solution you came up with, that they did face the very real prospect uh, that they'd face a, a military option. Um, that um, may not quite fit with this construct that uh, Mike was given by uh, our boss, uh, President Bush, but I think uh, realistically, uh, that's where we ought to be today, and I'm, I don't have any confidence at all that that's where we are. I don't think uh, President Obama has ever staked out that firm a position and uh, made it clear to the Iranians that there's a price to be paid if they go forward. Every, what everybody uh, doesn't want to talk about is what's the world like with uh, nuclear-armed Iran? And uh, are we better off if we, uh, if we take fairly bold and aggressive action to strip them of that capability? or if we back off and we let them uh, go forward and develop an inventory of nuclear weapons. Who will they give it to? Well, Who will they share it with? This is mm -hmm. one of the world's worst terror sponsoring states, Hezbollah, Hamas, etc. One of the biggest, face, biggest threats we face in the United States is a terrorist organization equipped with, with a nuclear capability or a biological agent of some kind. It'll make 9-11 look like a, a much less of a problem. All of a sudden, we're faced with a situation where we've got several hundred thousand dead Americans because of that kind of threat. And I think realistically, if we're going to see the, the North Koreas of the world and uh, the Irans of the world and the Syrias of the world develop that kind of capability, we face the very real prospect that at some point, a um, uh, deadly adversary will acquire capability that uh, we can't let them have. Now, that's not just a bomb the Syrian nuclear uh, plant in the desert right. activity. It's a, that would be a campaign against Iran because of the, the dimension of the nuclear effort. Uh, am, I, am I wrong about that? that well, would be quite possibly, obviously, depend on circumstances at the time. Where did they get it? What do they do with it? Um, no, but if, if one were to eliminate that mm -hmm. capability in Iran, to do that would be quite an undertaking. This is not a, uh, a couple of installations to be bombed. Quite possibly. Yeah. Now, if sanctions have happened, and mm -hmm. uh, as they already have, and uh, uh, a great deal of diplomacy, um, and still the centrifuges are, are running um, in Iran, yep. does that lead you to the conclusion that there is only one option at this point with the country? Or do you think that diplomacy could still work? Well. Over the years, we've watched uh, the Israelis deal with these threats. They're the ones most directly affected by it. We saw them in the, back in the early 80s take out the Iraqi reactor at Osirik. Um, they uh, took a lot of grief for it at the time, but I sent uh, David Ivory, who was then commanding their Air Force, a thank you letter in 1991 
uh, because otherwise, if he hadn't done what he did back in the early 80s, Saddam might well have had a nuclear weapon by 1991 when we went in the first time to kick him out of Kuwait. Um, subsequent to that, they've taken out the Syrian reactor uh, that the North Koreans built for him uh, in uh, last year, in, in uh, 07, fall of 07. Um, that was a good piece of work, too. Uh, that time around, they didn't take much uh, uh, pain for it when they, uh, when they did it. The Syrians didn't even say anything. They just quietly covered it up mm -hmm. and went on about their business. Um, so I, um, I think if you contemplate the possibility that uh, some of these regimes, especially if they have a tie to terror, if they are, have a relationship with a terrorist organization, Th then you've got to look at that nuclear weapon in a very different light than if you're talking about the Soviets during the Cold War using it for deterrence. One of the most disturbing reports I've seen recently, this was in the press, it's not classified. I don't see classified information anymore. But um, it was in the press recently, I think both in the New York Times and the Washington Post, that uh, was attributed to A.Q. Khan, the father of the Pakistani nuclear program, um, then went into business for himself and set up a black market operation, which we closed down. Uh, Libya was his best customer. We got that all shut down and got him under house arrest. But he was quoted recently as saying that North Korea had bribed Pakistani officials in order to acquire the uh, equipment they needed to build centrifuges hmm. uh, to build a uranium enrichment capability to replace their old plutonium system that they'd been using. So you've got North Koreans paying Pakistanis, officials, someplace military or in their program, in order to uh, acquire nuclear capability. Um, and if the North Koreans can do it, um, what's to stop somebody else from doing it? You, so uh, that's, you know, again, uh, that's a press report. You don't rely on everything you read in the newspapers. Yeah. But that was a very disturbing piece of information. You, you mentioned Israel um, bombing the plant in in Iraq, bombing the plant in, in Syria. Those are one-off events, yep. single installations. Um, are you suggesting that Israel might, d does Israel, in your mind, have the capability of eliminating the Iranian nuclear threat militarily, or w would the United States get drawn into that? I, uh, I, I can't answer that. I really don't know. Um, I, uh, I mean, my dealings with the Israelis, they care enough to figure out a way to do it. I'd be amazed if they let it go forward uh, unencumbered, if in fact uh, they're not able to stop it uh, through the sanctions effort that they're now a part of. And if the Israelis did do something like that, what would the U.S. position be? Well, I, for one, would stand up and cheer. Um, usually what happens is the State Department prevails and there are some messages exchanged, but I think, uh, I think the problem uh, if the Iranians go forward and are successful in developing nuclear weapons, that's not a problem just for the Israelis, although they're the ones most directly affected because they live in the neighborhood, but it's going to be a problem for all of us. You, you, you write in your book about North Korea and this issue of right. North Korea's um, nuclear plants. Policies that ignore or reward dangerous behavior by our adversaries do not work. Concessions delivered out of desperation in the naive hope that despots will respond in kind tend not to enhance the security of the United States. So you're talking about the failure, U.S. Mm -hmm. failure policy right. uh, during the Bush administration uh, to, uh, to get North Korea to eliminate its nuclear weapons. Uh, what went wrong? How do we fix it now? Well, I laid out in the book uh, what I thought were some guidelines that ought to be followed. But um, in effect, what happened was we laid down markers and then we didn't enforce them. Um, we laid down a marker when they tested that first nuclear weapon in the fall of 06, and then they, uh, we said, don't proliferate. And then within a matter of months, we found they had, in fact, built a, a reactor for the Syrians. Um, the um, president made what I think was a very good effort initially when uh, decided to approach it on a multinational basis. We're going to get the Chinese, partly because they're the sort of the number one traders with respect to North Korea. Uh, they do more business with North Korea than anybody else. But he also had the Japanese, the South Koreans, the Russians, the U.S., six of us involved. Unfortunately, uh, the effort uh, began to break down when we got into a situation where our State Department wanted to uh, uh, deal bilaterally with the North Koreans. 
and we moved away from the idea of a collective effort of the uh, five nations working to uh, uh, persuade them that they ought to give up their nuclear weapons. Um, that was a serious misjudgment. We should have worked hard to keep that together. We should have taken advantage when the North uh, set off a weapon uh, to use that as an excuse to reconvene the group and say, look, you know, the North Koreans are developing weapons. We ought to be able to say to the Chinese, they've got to be concerned about Japan getting back into the business or South Korea um, uh, moving to develop their capabilities if, in fact, there's going to be a North Korea that's heavily armed with nuclear weapons. Um, but we didn't do any of that. We didn't move to use the North Korean misbehavior uh, effectively, I felt, in connection, for example, with the... Um, uh, with working the Chinese account. Oh, so the I, what I suggested was that we should have taken out the Syrian reactor ourselves and that that would have reinforced uh, in major ways uh, the notion to the North Koreans that we meant business, to the Syrians that we meant business, and uh, would have helped a lot in terms of establishing our credibility on these issues. We didn't do it. Do you think that the Chinese really want to play ball on the North Korean issue? Um, is it really in their interest to put the arm on um, on North Korea? They don't, they don't want to create a instability there. They don't want refugees into China. Maybe they even like the fact that North Korea keeps the U.S. a little off balance. Well, I think the North Koreans have played us masterfully. Uh, they did the Clinton administration, too. I think they'll probably do the same thing to the Obama administration. Um, they, uh, they know how to jerk our chain, enter into negotiations, agree, get whatever benefits are to be derived from the agreement, and then go back to business Chinese as Chinese appear to be happy to watch this. Well, I think the Chinese are, I'm guessing now, I can't claim to be a Chinese expert, but that the Chinese have never been forced to step up and, and uh, be part of the solution. Uh, we got on the agenda, we had some discussions about it, but in the final analysis, they've always been able to be confident that the United States uh, isn't going to um, manage it as deftly as we should. And uh, in the final analysis, they'd rather not have the problem of having to deal with uh, the North Korean problem. Lastly, um, in your book, you spend a, a number of pages in a very <laughs> interesting analysis of how the intelligence about weapons of mass destruction in Iraq was formulated over decades, right. over multiple administrations, um, convincing many presidents and uh, many people in Congress mm -hmm. of their existence and of the threat of Saddam Hussein. Um, with the, the certainty that we had uh, in the administration going into the Iraq war that there were weapons of mass destruction there, and you cite the intelligence, um, at the end of the day, uh, no matter where the intelligence might have been coming from, wasn't it really up to the CEO and the COO, and for lack of better parallel, the mm -hmm. president and the vice president, to vet that information uh, and to be certain of it before making so major a bet, sending troops into another country? Mm -hmm. Well, I, uh, to the extent that you can be certain about that kind of intelligence, um, we were. Uh, I, and I can remember the meeting where we sat down in the Oval Office with the director of the CIA and with his deputy. And uh, um, George Tenet at the time was, was the director. And I said, OK, George, how good is the intelligence on Iraq WMD? And the answer was, it's a slam dunk, Mr. President, a slam dunk. But it wasn't just something we'd come up with. I mean, there's this notion that somehow uh, Bush and Cheney sat around in the Oval Office on Saturday morning and dreamed up the idea of Iraqi WMD, and it wasn't that way at all. It had been back in 98 when Saddam kicked out the inspectors, 98 when Congress passed uh, the Liberation, Iraq Liberation Act, appropriated $100 million to, to uh, support the political opposition inside Iraq. Uh, Bill Clinton made a speech in 98 that sounded like me in, in 2002. Um, exact same uh, phrases almost in terms of Saddam has weapons of mass destruction. Saddam's going to use weapons of mass destruction. Um, Hillary Clinton made that kind of a speech. Jay Rockefeller made that kind of a speech. Uh, Carl Levin made that kind of a speech. It was throughout the government. It wasn't just a Bush Cheney construct by any means. The first major report I recall after we got after we got elected, so this is during the transition, was on Iraqi WMD. 
And for the next, uh, what, 27 months until we actually launched into Iraq, there was a steady drum fire of that kind of reporting coming in. Um, now, the, the bottom line, when it was all over with, we had the Iraq survey group headed up initially by David Kay and then Charles Dulfer took over when Kay finished and, and completed the report. And uh, I heard from Dulfer the other day that, um, and, and this is attributed to uh, the FBI agent who, in fact, debriefed Saddam for several months after he was captured. Um, Saddam said he'd be back in business within a year uh, after uh, the uh, sanctions were lifted. He'd back, be back in the weapons back of mass in destruction. The weapons of mass destruction. Mm -hmm. David Kay said that uh, he was more worried about the threat that Iraq represented after he'd done the survey than he was before when he thought he had a stockpile of weapons because he had the people who knew the technology, he had the capacity to produce, he had produced and used it before, and he fully expected to again. Um, so the, the notion that there was no threat there or that it was just a sort of a big empty hole in the ground that uh, um, uh, never had anything in it or that there was no threat of any kind just doesn't stand up to analysis. What happened was those people who all saw the same intelligence we did. Uh, it wasn't passed out on a partisan basis. It wasn't limited to the executive branch. Um, everybody had the same conclusion we did, including the Germans and the Brits. Um, they, uh, they all came to the same conclusions. And the fact of the matter was, he didn't have stockpiles, but he had everything else. And uh, he had what he needed to get back into the business again. And uh, he had every intention of doing so. So I think we're much better off with Saddam gone. I think getting rid of Saddam is what caused Gaddafi to cough up his materials. And uh, the world's a lot better off with the two of them out of the nuclear business than if you had Saddam and Baghdad and Gaddafi and Tripoli and they both had nukes. Vice President Dick Cheney, thanks for joining us. Thank you.